I don't know if it would be helpful for you, but um, or for the audience, but I do have a two-minute video that kind of encapsulates all everything that we saw on the ground at the village level, yeah. and the, uh, it's just a two-minute video, and it, and it shows kind of the solution that we came up with based on the problem that we saw. Yeah, we could do it at the end of the session. Okay. But I would like to ask specifically from you: Did you feel there were any obstacles, or there were really? Some uh, some barriers or areas which could have wished were not there when you started here. Where in when you in started India? The, your Indian venture, yeah. Um, barriers, I, I I can't think of any right now. I mean, I, I think this is a paradise for no. In terms of either setting up a new company or getting the uh, the type of people you required or getting the initial funding that you had or. You could make do with your own initial contribution, uh, things I, like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the you know the only thing that um, if I could remove any barrier, I mean, any anything that can go wrong on a daily basis does go wrong, and I just I, every day I kick myself and I you know why didn't I think of that potential problem? Or that, why didn't I think of that potential problem? Every vendor we have seems to you know. Say, say to us, yes, we'll get it to you by tomorrow, and it doesn't happen. But those kind of things you just, you get used to after five years, okay. um, and, you, and you work around it. Um, and I just can't say enough for the, uh, the type of can-do attitude that, that we find here in India. Okay. Thank you. I think we have got our third panelist, and Nishit Desai, who has been in this business for a long time. He has got his own offices and presence in Silicon Valley, as in India, and he has taken close look at all the support structure required for new ventures and startups uh, involved with the venture funds, involved advising on agreements, involved in doing new collaborations. I would like to invite him to talk about the entire ecosystem in terms of both business, technology, legal issues, and where we are and what are the Issues. How much time do I have? I can talk for a whole day yeah, without start. charge. You can start. You can start for the first five minutes and then. Okay. See. Tell me when you want to stop. Uh, first of all, I resonated very well with uh, what uh, Adil spoke about. I'll start where he ended. He said, "A Gujarati and a chemist shop. You won't believe." in my life, exactly the same thing happened. I happened to be Gujarati and I started with a chemist shop. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't believe I had a promise in my life. And uh, uh, it was my uncle. I was in a small village and at the early age, he brought me to Mumbai to work in a medical store in Bandra. Okay. It was called Bakshi Medical Store on Waterfield Road. It's now called Basi Medical Store and I don't know it exists today. But, you know, I was not a great student, you know, like Purjit uh, Yagnik, whom I know since he was a small boy too. Okay. And they all thought that I'm not going to study and, you know, it's a good thing to, uh, you know. They deliberately make it a point we don't study because then we become entrepreneurs. <laughs> you know, because once you get educated, you want to take a good job and push your life and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, that's how my life started. Uh, a bank said that I finished my law and did my master's in law and then I was interested in international tax. And I was the first person to start international tax way back in 1977. I did all the comparative studies and all that kind of stuff. But India was not global. And uh, now I have a big problem. Because I'm dressed up to go nowhere, you know. So what a lawyer does who has no practice in India, right? I started lecturing, I started writing articles. That's what all lawyers do when they don't have practice. <laughs> and, uh, but incidentally from my writings, company called Bechtel in California picked me up. And then of course there was no looking back. My whole practice grew in the U.S. almost 95% of uh, maybe 100% work in the early 80s. But one good thing came to my hand because I was an Indian tax lawyer to start with. It was so easy for me to learn every tax system in the world because every kind of tax existed in India. <laughs> you know, and, and 
not only that, but it did not only exist, but I also knew how people avoid tax and evade tax. <laughs> At one point of time, we had 97.5% tax in India on individual. If you allow disallowances, it was 102%. After that, India decided we'll never tax anybody more than 100%. Very charitable. <laughs> okay. So I think, but the great news was that every demsess, tax, levy, any kind of expression you use, it's like, you know, you drive in Mumbai or elsewhere, you can drive anywhere in the world. Of course, in your own way. But anyway, I'm sorry, I shouldn't. Five minutes are over? No. You can carry on. Okay. So uh, anyway, but what I was trying to tell you, now I'm learning. U.S. is learning from India too. I tell you, U.S., I was, fortunately I was a tax lawyer. Since 1981, I must be going eight times. Every month I go to the U.S. One lesson I learned, never take up U.S. citizenship. Next lesson, don't take up green card. If you want to go, go on L1 or sometime on H1B, but best is L1. Okay, I'm just giving quick tip, no charge. Okay, but... Um, the reason is that once you are a U.S. citizen or a green card holder, you are taxed on worldwide income. And in many cases, even if you don't receive income, you can still be taxed. Okay. Number one. Uh, other thing is that if you hold citizenship or a green card in 8 out of 15 years, and if you say that now it's too much of a problem, because you mentioned today tax rates in the U.S. would go close to 60%. Okay, India is 30, which is not bad. Uh, uh, and so if you give up your citizenship or a green card, then it is deemed that you have disposed of all your global assets and you pay tax even though you do not really dispose of. So to give up, citizenship is also ek bar gale mein aage na bolte hai. So it is like that. So that is one as far as individuals are concerned. Second thing, and I learned it, Never, at least, unless there is some special reason, never incorporate a parent company in the U.S. Once you, it is like citizenship. Once it comes into your neck, you cannot migrate U.S. company or a property out of the U.S. It is called inversion. So if you migrate, because many times what happens in the U.S., the tax rate is 39 percent on the corporate. Then there is a state level tax. Is this it about 13 percent tax? City like income, uh, city like New York has third level of income tax, another 10 percent. So corporates are paying heavy taxes there. I am not against payment of taxes, but as Shadow said, that taxes are the roots of all evils. All that I like as a tax lawyer to do is to remove this evil to some extent. But <laughs> and the estate duty on the top, estate tax in the U.S. could also be almost 45 percent plus state level estate tax and stuff like that. So these are some of the things as far as the taxes are concerned. I think uh, I, I don't want to go too much into detail as we go along, I'll tell you. But next important thing is to look at the IP. Once you house IP also in the US, you cannot take it out. Again, there are issues to that. So structuring becomes very important part of the whole game. And uh, lastly, somebody talked about valuation. Okay, And uh, the way in which I look at and bear in mind, everything has, I think Einstein said, the definitional context, right? You must know what is value and what is price. A lot of people get confused between price and the value. Price is a function of demand and supply. Valuation is a matter of opinion. So, you know, same piece of art, somebody will value at X price, somebody will value at Y. Especially in the IP, valuations become very important. And you need to know how do you value, how do you go about it. So I think some of those things, I think I, I don't want to go at the moment okay. too long because we have a lot of time and the whole day, I'm thank sure. You so much. Yeah, thank you so much. I think we, we have got excellent, uh, I think, situation as it is today. And currently what's happening and some good tips. I think that already you have got decoded all your charges of coming here. Uh, what I would like to now ask, uh, you know, globally there have been attempts by various countries, various uh, cities, to sort of recreate Silicon Valley. And people have been enamored by it, whether rightly or wrongly in most cases, with good intentions certainly, whether they would or not. Uh, like uh, just now you mentioned by Mr. Adhijan also, that there are global clusters which have come up. Some of them trying to model on them, some of them finding a new path. 
I would like now the panelists to basically tell us two things. One is that what it is really that means Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, that is number one, uh, without looking at the current problems which need to be addressed and overcome. And secondly, more specifically for us in India and more so institute like IIT Bombay, which has got some elements of this ecosystem in place, what it is that we could achieve the positives and the right requisites of Silicon Valley for us. I will start again with Mr. Jim Lee. Well, let's, uh, yeah, I, I want to respond to what Mr. Desai said first. Uh, and I don't know that this will be very popular here because I know that right now the American government, from what we understand, what we read is very popular outside of America. Uh, I don't know, if, would you say that uh, our government is popular here or not popular? Help me. Popular. Okay. For entrepreneurs right now, this is the worst time in American history. Uh, entrepreneurs now are under attack. We talk about it all the time. We feel like entrepreneurship is being crushed by the government. Right now, in America, we say that the best place to go and start a business is in communist China. I, mean, I would start a business in China before I would start a business in the United States. It's just easier, right? Uh, the taxes in, uh, are becoming incredibly uh, oppressive, and it's becoming a very big problem for us. But not only that, it's the regulation and something that we haven't spoken about yet is the extensive regulations that we are increasing now. So when we're talking about raising money in the United States, the last thing I would do, just like you said, wouldn't start a company in the United States, I would not take money from Silicon Valley right now or any American venture capital company. The regulations that will be placed upon your company because of that are going to cost a tremendous amount of money. Right now, I'm advising my uh, the companies that I work with to only take angel and to take angel money in big chunks, not in little chunks, because of the number of investors that would come with it. So right now, if you have five investors in the United States, that's good. If you have 49, okay. If you get above 50, you start encountering uh, problems that I'm going to have to hire Mr. Desai to take care of. So the, uh, the infrastructure, the ecosystem, I don't think is as important right now is that you understand that right now there's a big cloud over the United States that us entrepreneurs feel. I don't know if any of you have read any of the, the famous books that talk about the givers in society and then the takers in society. And right now, I would say that this is the, the worst time in American history to be an entrepreneur. It's very, very depressing. And we are looking to China, India, Taiwan for encouragement. We're not finding it in the United States. And it's just a bad time to be an entrepreneur there. You should stay here. I think, Jim, thanks for that. But I would like to come back to, I think, the, uh, the point of the discussion that we are having today is really what made Silicon Valley Silicon Valley. You have 20 years more experience in entrepreneurship. And what it is that made in 70s, 80s, and 90s the Intels, the Apples, the Googles to come up. What it was that the ecosystem which was there. Today there are problems. But what is it is that was there and what something you can learn and create, try to create here. Well, you know, Kleiner Perkins was the first big venture capital firm. Uh, it was mentioned already once today, Kleiner. They, uh, you know, were, were the true beginning of what we would call the venture capital community there. And now their importance is you know, absolutely, they're the most, uh, one of the biggest venture firms there. The, uh, the people moved there because of that. You need to remember Facebook was not founded in venture in Silicon Valley. Most of the companies that you hear about uh, moved there because of the access to what they thought was good capital, the community, and all of that. We are seeing that now everywhere else in the United States too. So just like India is trying to copy the ecosystem of Silicon Valley, so is Austin and Boston and Atlanta. And we're seeing it uh, everywhere. I do not want you to copy the model of Silicon Valley because it's not a long-term model 
I don't know that it's going to succeed in the end. Right now we are seeing, I believe, it beginning to fall apart. The fact that venture capitalists are leaving tells you something. Those are the smartest people, and the smartest people in the room are leaving. Doesn't that scare you? It scares me. When the smart people leave, I want to follow them. Thanks. Yeah. I'd like to speak about that. I think more on the historical and what really right thing they did and which we could adopt. Yeah, I think the, the, the most important parallel between our community in Boston and here at IIT is the university infrastructure. And um, in Boston, there's an incredible uh, environment for startups. Um, we see uh, amazing growth in, in Boston. I mean, maybe you don't like the tax laws, but you know, there are uh, companies sprouting up because of the university infrastructure. Uh, and now the governments are, are really starting to take hold and realizing that we have something powerful here. And so what we did as a startup just to find uh, cheap real estate is we found a very large warehouse and we now have uh, it, it's basically a clean tech incubator where we're all, all about 27 clean tech startups are sharing uh, machine shop space very expensive equipment and 95 percent of those companies and most of the companies that I meet in Boston come from business plan competitions from MIT um, and all the other universities, uh, because it's such an open environment that they've created at, M at an MIT, um, all the other university students and professionals kind of gravitate toward this famous competition called the 100K Business Plan. And it forces uh, you to create the business plan to go, to go through a set of milestones through that competition. And um, I would think that IIT Bombay has an incredible opportunity to do something similar. Um, I get a sense that, you know, just, just entering into the campus this morning, I get a sense that it's somewhat closed off community. Um, where at MIT, Harvard, BU, you can walk into any classroom. They're all unlocked. Um, they're, and just the, the openness of having executives like me come in and participate, um, I think an, is an enabler for entrepreneurship. Thank you. This side. Yeah. yeah. I you wanted something before I ask you? Yeah. Sure. I think uh, there are two things I uh, would mention. Uh, number one, the difference I find here and there, is that in the U.S., in Silicon Valley, to fail is not a crime. To fail dishonestly is a crime. In India, it's exactly otherwise. Uh, to fail uh, itself is a crime, and fail uh, dishonestly is respected sometimes. You know, and people give credit just because somebody has money. I think that's not really the way to go about. And um, um, uh, I, I think uh, I, I just tell you my own experience, and you're all friends, so I can share. I, I just invested uh, some about hundred thousand dollars in a company called Law Pivot in uh, in California. Okay, the, somebody who worked with me and he went into that. On thirty first December, the company, you know, almost everything was lost. But I felt so happy losing money. You won't believe, month on month basis, right from the start, the communication that the entrepreneur carried out with me, I was completely satisfied that even if I lost all my money, I felt very happy about it. That's very unusual. When you lose money and you feel happy is not always the case. And if he wants another money, I would still go after him because he was honest and he failed honestly, fine. I think that is the kind of culture I would like to see. The second point is that the respect for IP is much more there than in India, you know. In many countries, of course, compared to India, uh, you know, like Russia and others, you have to go and explain that what is the concept of property? Forget about intellectual property. Itself, many countries are still coming to grips with because they are coming from Russian uh, or other mindset. Property itself does not belong to an individual because it belongs to state. That's the mindset. In India, at least, that is there. But still, respect for IP is not 
that much as if you go to a bank or somebody else. We need some institutions like Silicon Valley Bank and other ones who understand the IP value. Now, uh, therefore, you know, neither S Silicon Valley, which was very good, as you said, I think is uh, uh, going to Problems. another uh, downtown spiral. India, we had 97.5 percent tax. We have now about 34 and plus other taxes and whatnot. But the complications make tax rates too close to 50, 60. I don't know. But with transfer pricing and stuff like that, an illogical loss. That's another problem in India. So what do you do? You go to the third country, depending on. So today, best thing is neither to set a company in India, nor to start in the U.S., but go to a third country, which are good, credible jurisdictions, and develop property and IP over there. Only problem Singapore is when you go into complex structure, then sometimes legal fees are slightly higher. Bigger pardon? Singapore. Singapore has been very good. No, that, okay, if I may just <laughs> comment on Singapore. Uh, I like Silicon Valley for its creativity, and I like Singapore for its discipline. Now, typically what happens, that creative people are not disciplined, <laughs> and so disciplined people are not creative. So I think once you get into the structured, and maybe my friend will, uh, uh, they are trying very hard to develop entrepreneurship. They want to put a lot of money, but the mindset is so structured at times, again, with respect, there are people and there are people, but you may comment on that. But my experience is that, you know, it is a good place to go. One thing that has happened lately, Singapore has become extremely expensive. In fact, there is little political backlash at this point in time, which is not unusual in, the, in Singapore. But Singapore is a very good jurisdiction, all said and done, quality of life and stuff like that. But it's a little more expensive, it is becoming expensive. So, you know, you've got to really scan the world and see, and geography always goes up and down somewhere, and you've got to really. But there are many jurisdictions which are coming up, and I'm sure that smaller jurisdictions, I, I may take one minute on yes, this point, yes. yeah. if you don't mind. My feel is that if you're looking 30 years from now, okay, we'll forget about India, we'll forget, I think we'll forget about many other countries, I don't know about the US, but we'll, there will be what I feel is there will be disappearance of nation state because technology goes across political boundaries. It doesn't see it's like or something like that, you know. So my gut feel is that, uh, and I will, I'm doing a project on that. If some of you want to uh, uh, participate, and this serious talk, I'm not talking lightly, is how do we make nations disappear? Because the geographical boundaries, like the U.S. is immigration laws is worst form of protection in the world and it's a worst form of human rights violation if you ask me because you do not allow people to cross boundaries we are all animals right if water is on the other side of the border i should be able to drink and be pro you know survive so why don't you allow but i think uh, us will have to be educated a lot more but uh, but coming to uh, this thing i think the way in which i look at next 30 years is there will be more and more disintegration of nations. Business week of 2000, millennium is you see, they said there will be 2000 nations in this world because technology will break all this smaller uh, entities, smaller um, uh, nanotechnology, I think they will become and we will move more from democracy to netocracy. I think that is the subject some point in time I would like to talk on, yeah. but uh, at this point in time I would limit Thank myself. You. If you have any question, yeah, I'll be this I would that. like to ask you one more question sure. specifically to you. And that is, we heard in the morning that uh, from where we are today, we require at least 10 times more early stage venture financing. So what it is you believe is the situation today and what we need to do so that we can reach that level of participation in the startup. I agree with you that it is insatiable. But one good thing that has happened in India is that the new companies bill which is coming up, okay, uh, it is passed in Lok Sabha, Lok Sabha. it's a lower house. Soon, one best thing I like in this particular uh, law is that uh, there is going to be some kind of uh, spin on CSR, what you call, you know, corporate social, social, social responsibility. responsibility. Now look at those companies which have earned at least five crores of profit in the last three years. They will they will have to put two percent of their profits in CSR. In fact, there, there are some who are already doing more. But this is a new pool of money that is coming up. 
Now, when you talk of CSR, there are 10 different items helping the poor, these, that, etc. Nine items. And the tenth item is something called social business, which was the great news to me. I am very close to one gentleman called uh, Dr. Mohammed Yunus in Bangladesh, and we always spend one day just creating Grameen Bank. Yeah. Grameen Bank. But 50 different businesses he has created. The next age for a country like India is going to be more to a social business. There is so much scope for innovation. There is so much uh, unmet needs. Immediately you can have a scalable business and it could be equally profitable. I remember first time when I helped uh, uh, SKS Microfinance uh, in 2001, Everybody thought it was a charity and stuff like that. Turned out to be a very lucrative, lucrative business and of course I would not go into other things. Other but yeah. all said and done, more and more charitable organizations will turn to become social businesses. Now what is the difference between business, a normal business and a social business? In normal business, the CEO's performance is determined with reference to the bottom line. Okay, and how much profit you made, how much you that's the main criteria. In social business, there's multiple bottom lines. So not only you have to be sustainable, not only you must have profit, but you should also demonstrate what impact you create in a society, how many children you taught, how many hospitals, etc., stuff like that. And more and more charitable organizations, which are not becoming sustainable, but they will become good business models. And again, I'll be happy to talk on that subject uh, uh, separately how to build social business models and there is a lot both in terms of business modeling and also use of technology. I have another friend called Sam Pitroda, we have been friends for the last 40 years and he taught me one thing that Nishit, technology is the greatest social leveler. So if you really want to have equity, I would not say equal, uh, equity is slightly different than uh, equality. But if you really want to instill equity in the society, I think technology is going to play an enormous role and all of you have tremendous role to play. As focus on those technologies, I'm sure, at least to start with it will be and what models you develop in India, India is a good lab and then you can sell it to the world. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with three of your, your points. One, um, half of our money came from social impact investors. Um, just to put things into context, we have developed a thermal battery that bridges the electricity gap that exists in rural India to enable dairy farmers to chill milk. Um, and we're a for-profit in theory. Um, hopefully yeah, in, in, the, in, the, in the future. Yeah, but we're, we're not selling to villages. We're, we're selling to dairy processors. And I, I, to follow up your point on failure, um, Three years ago, we installed the most beautiful solar-powered milk chiller that you could ever imagine. And this is something that the largest private dairy requested. And when the owner, the, the, uh, the owner of India's largest private dairy from, from Chennai came to see it, oh, God, I, you know, you told me how big this was going to be, but how, how are these sheds in the villages going to sustain the weight of these solar panels? And this thing is so damn big. And what have you guys done? And you know, he saw how de dejected we were. And he said, guys, when I started my business in the 60s, I made more mistakes than you could ever imagine. But I can tell you one thing, and these words changed my life. He said, success breeds, of uh, failure breeds success. And oftentimes, success breeds arrogance. And because we weren't arrogant at that time. OK, I think just last, we need to wrap up now quickly. Jim, I think I would like uh, your experience. Jim, I would like to know from you some of the models which were developed in the USA in the last, say, 10 years or so. Some of the models developed for supporting entrepreneurship, like the wire combinator. Yes. Yeah. Uh, would you like to say something about that and something which we can take as a example? Yeah. Right. Uh, we do have a very strong infrastructure for taking small ideas and turning them into big companies, we have a uh, large uh, group of uh, infrastructure type incubators, but also contests. He was com uh, asking about why Combinator. Those uh, types of events are 
very, very good in terms of helping young entrepreneurs meet people, get access to money, and also get access to the other engineers and the support teams that will build that. Those sort of programs happen everywhere. So I think one of the differences between the United States and one of the things that India needs to take from it is that this sort of program happens at almost every college uh, in the United States. Right now, entrepreneurship is the number one topic in business schools. Everyone's focused on it uh, in terms of education. And so the, uh, the contests like this are even happening in middle schools, right? We're having middle schools now that have competitions and some great things like that. My son, I have a 15-year-old son, he's taking a business class now and they must write business plans in the class and they will actually have a competition and the winner gets $100 to start the business, uh, $100. But for a 15-year-old, that's actually more than he needs, right? His business plan is about uh, mowing lawns in the neighborhood and walking dogs in the neighborhood. And so he doesn't even need $100, right? He's already successful without the money. The idea, though, is that Every university needs to be doing this, right? Uh, it's fantastic that IIT Mumbai is doing this, but there are a thousand other universities and colleges here in Mumbai that are not doing things like this. So one of the great things that could happen is if more and more uh, inclusion, you know, I had friends who couldn't get in today to the, uh, some of the sessions. The idea of making this more open and more inclusive is a goal that India should have, right? That's the one thing that I would copy from the United States is have more events like this. Uh, in Atlanta, I could go to an event like this every day. Every day there is an event just like this in my city. And so it's not a matter of deciding what I want to do, it's a matter of deciding I can't do those, right? Think about that. You're very proud to have this event as you should be. Imagine doing this every single day. Thank you. Since time, uh, I would like to, I think, conclude this by asking you on two things. One is the new trend towards crowdfunding. Crowdfunding, and uh, I think uh, Mr. Desai also can mention about the Jobs Act, which Obama has created to encourage new creation, venture of new creation venture. I actually don't know much about those two topics. The crowdfunding, yeah. you would like to say something? Yeah. Or Jim, you want to say about crowdfunding? Yeah. Well, you know, we used to say friends and family. We had an expression that was also uh, fools. You know, fools and there's another word that's dirty that we're not allowed to use. Uh, now, crowdfunding, there's crowd and clown like a clown, they sound very similar, and so we're calling it clown funding. Uh, it's very early, some great successes, but also a lot of big failures, in that. but I do love that. I think that it will be one of the greatest things that ha happens in America, sort of the democratization of raising money. Anyone can raise money now much easier. So I love the crowdfunding. I think it will be a huge change, and it's something you want to start a business here in India, if you, I don't know if there are many crowdfunding sites, but that would be a great business to start something along those lines. The Jobs Act that you mentioned, again, you, you will not like my answer. American entrepreneurs hate it. It is horrible for us. Uh, we are, there, there's nothing about it that we like. And so I understand that that's not a popular answer, but that's the truth. That in America, the entrepreneurs, the people that own businesses, are in hiding. We're, we're scared. We're afraid of the government right now. And this is, uh, the Jobs Act is one of the largest things that we see that's wrong with our country. Uh, very, very depressing, in my opinion. And I completely disagree. I, we get complete support from our government. We got an NSF grant that catapulted our technology. Or so, SBIR funding. Yeah, SBIR, yeah, yeah. small yeah. business uh, funding. Yeah. Um, they've completely supported our incubator. So, you know, there are two, two different opinions there. Yeah, I think I would like to end on a positive note with uh, Mr. Desai's comments 
on is there some way in which we can bring best of both the worlds from the US and India to create a model which can help the budding entrepreneurs? Yeah, I that think will close. Uh, yeah. <coughs> one lesson which uh, my friend, uh, late Dr. Sikhe Pillar taught me was uh, take best practices and develop next practices. Okay. And there is so much to learn. Silicon Valley and the US have learned so much, but I think somewhere along the line, there is mismatch at the at the level at which government in the US thinks and at the level at which I think things are really happening. So there are some things like SPAs on the world and some of the things that you just spoke, both are happening. Now we can bring in institutions like SPA in India also. I am not really a proponent of government intervention by and large. So ideally speaking, if we develop some regulations for crowdfunding, even though it's a small funding, yeah. biggest problem in crowdfunding from a legal perspective is that would small person be taken on a ride, you know? Because I, I, the idea is that you, you can put in small, if, even if you have 5,000 rupee, 5,000 dollars in the US or 3,000 dollars in the US, you can still be a venture capitalist in your own way. So as a concept, it's a great idea, but the regulatory framework is still not in place. So you can put all the things, yeah. I think crowdfunding, in, if you can, uh, you know, Obama won whole election with dollar, dollar collection, right? So it's, 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 it's an interesting idea. I'm meeting with actually uh, Sebi on a Tuesday. Okay. Any of you have any thoughts on uh, this, uh, SMEs or any other thing? That is one thing. Second thing I would suggest is that if we can create a, some kind of a think tank, uh, with, uh, I'll be delighted to participate with our law firm as well. Because what is required is 5, 10, 15 people really sit down and really do good work. We have all great ideas, just as an entrepreneur's uh, summit you always talk about. But implementing the ideas is very important thing. If we go and tell government this is a good recommendation, that is good recommendation. Actually, they will lies in details. You have to draft those regulations well. The biggest problem is over there. So we should, I think, create number three, even just a matter of uh, for the collaboration. Uh, yeah, we'll be happy to host the mentoring sessions. As I said, every day you got it. If not every day, at least once a month, two times a month. Uh, only thing, if you can help you come to our office, it is easier because you don't want to pay thousand dollars by one hour charge, right? I'm not saying it's charged, no, don't worry. But um, uh, the reason I'm saying that we are willing to help and don't worry about fees. You know, there are two types of clients we differentiate. There are clients who are able to pay, but unwilling to pay. And there are clients who are unable to pay, but willing to pay. Second class is more welcome than the first class. So you don't worry about the fees and don't be swayed by number and all those kind of things. We are always there to help you. We have taken off and some equity in the company. We have helped. And I uh, personally am very passionate about even social sector. Uh, we have developed some models for, uh, uh, you know, in the social businesses. Uh, we can do so much in India sitting here. And we can think on a global basis, just not India-centric. I think that's the last message I would give. Thank you. thank you so much. I think we need to stop here. We have already exceeded our time. But once more, thank you to all the panelists. And, uh, I'm sure it, is, it has set the tone for the next two days and uh, I hope you will be available either through communication now or through email later. You can interact with some of us and get forward. Thank you so much. We close now. <laughs>